Shabbat Shalom. It felt almost um, embarrassing, pr embarrassingly private to be listening in to the argument between Sarai and Avram. Although, I will point out, I'll probably call them Abraham and Sarah a lot more. Their name is changed by the end of this parasha, after all. But didn't you feel like we were intruding on an intimate moment between a couple in the midst of a very real, a very believable argument. Oh, no, we don't have the concubinage system of the ancient Near East, which was a, a quite common activity in those days. Um, but I'm sure that some of us at different times have either engaged in similar arguments or have overheard uh, other couples having such arguments. Why aren't you? Yada, 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 yada. Well, why don't you? Blah, 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 blah. And most of us want to uh, step away and not hear those arguments uh, even though many of us from time to time are active participants in them. But we can't give Abraham and Sarah too much space because God recorded their argument. He put it into our Torah because there is much that we can learn from it. Not just the history of our people and the history of the people of Ishmael, but much more about how we live, how we work as a couple, and where we go. So let's take a look at this argument. On the surface, the Peshat, the simple level, why is Sarai angry at Avram? All right, let's take that question just by itself for the moment. Why is Sarai angry at Avram? Let's make sure we got the understanding of the situation. It was 10 years since they had been married. They still had no children. Sarai decided that she would take matters into her own hands and engage the system of concubinage, which was common in the ancient world, she wasn't inventing this, that her maidservant would be given to her husband so that through that act, any offspring would be considered hers. And lo and behold, Hagar conceives from Abraham's um, uh, activities. And then we get the blow up. What is the crux of Sarai's uh, argument here? So, reading between the lines, because the lines themselves don't say that, but reading between the lines, we might imagine that now that Hagar is conceiving uh, a child, that um, Abraham is probably treating her a little differently, uh, that she is not merely a surrogate for Sarai, but perhaps has more standing in her own right. Uh, and that we can read not only from the potential explanation of Sarai's explosion, but because the one piece of information we do have, which is of Hagar's attitude shift. So Hagar's attitude shift is described as, anybody remember the, the, the general wording? You can paraphrase, I don't expect a quote. Superior. What's that? Superior. superior. Or unfortunately, the way most people feel is superior is not by feeling better about themselves, but by feeling that someone else has been diminished. Uh, so it's not just that Hagar feels good about herself, that would be not such a problem, but she feels that Sarai has been lowered in her esteem. And that seems to be the crux of the problem. But if that's the crux of the problem, why is Sarai angry at her husband? If it is Hagar's attitude change that has made Sarai upset, why get mad at Abraham when it's Hagar that is the actual problem? Yes. Mm -hmm. So be angry at God? If, you, if she felt rejected at God, then she should be yelling at God, but instead she invokes God on her side. She doesn't say, ah, oh, woe is me, God has rejected me. Instead, she says, Abraham, <laughs> or Avram at the time, God judge between you and me, I am right in this. You are wrong. So it's not that she's upset at God. She is upset about Hagar, but why be upset at her husband when it's Hagar that has actually had the attitude change? No one's ever been in a relationship, apparently. 
So if Hagar's attitude has changed, and Avraham is standing by and says nothing, who is Sarai going to be angrier at? Right, at, at Avram, right? Like that is normal human behavior, right? All of us have done this at one point or another. The person who is most dear to us is most capable of hurting us with the least amount of effort, right? Hagar has to go above and beyond to get Sarai rankled up. But the fact that Avraham just goes, oh, is there a problem? What? Is what sets Sarai on edge. She is upset. Uh, now, we are being gender neutral here because, trust me, I have seen uh, both personally and in, in the, uh, the, the different examples before my own life, as well as from many others, that this is definitely bi-directional. Uh, it doesn't take a particular gender to behave in this way. But Avram seems to be either oblivious or unwilling to take action to tamp down Hagar's behavior in a way that would make Sarai happy until Sarai brings it to his attention. At which point, he says, OK, fine, do what you want. Right? If you think she's getting to be a bit too much, then uh, yeah, you can go ahead and treat her as though she were just your maidservant again, rather than the second wife and the, uh, the person carrying my child, which is also not a great solution uh, for this situation. Because, of course, that is going to send Hagar out running into the wilderness, and, well, history follows from there. That is the Peshat understanding. At, at core, it seems, just in the simplest understanding of the text, Sarai is most upset that she is not getting the support from her husband that she was hoping for, and that is allowing Hagar to behave in this way, which is changing what was meant to be an act of kindness to Avraham into an act of betrayal for Sarai, that she is not doing something that elevates her and Avraham she has ended up doing something that only elevates him with the gift of a child, and in fact, she has been lowered. Makes perfect sense. But we've got to take another step backwards. Because why are we in this position in the first place? That is to say, why did Sarai think that this needed to happen? God didn't tell them to do this. So what is the underlying cause, the tension, the concern, the problem that Sarai thought this would be a solution for, to give Hagar as a concubine to, Sarah, to Avram. What, what was the underlying problem? What, hold on. What was the underlying problem of why she did this in the first place? What was the crisis in the family? Ah, well, uh, there, there were no children. Let's make it more generic. Right? Because we're going to come back to that specific of exactly what we mean by that in just a second. But the basic fundamental crisis was there were no children in the family. And, and this is a major problem, uh, even in the modern world, although certainly being childless is a, a, a much more tenable uh, position in the modern world. But in the ancient world, being childless wasn't just a matter of, oh, I have so much to lo love to give and no child to give it to. Being childless in the ancient world meant that everything you had worked for would dissipate when you die. And before you die, there would be no one there to help you while you neared death. Because who was going to be around? What, your servants? They were there because you paid them. They, they, they didn't love you. They weren't going to feed you in your dotage. They weren't going to carry you when you became unable to move. Uh, those were that was what children did. And so by having no children, not only was the long-term future of Avram and Sarah in trouble, but even their near future, after all, they were spring chickens at this point in the story. And so that was the fundamental crisis that Sarai was trying to solve. Now, what was Avram doing to solve this crisis? I don't, don't know. We can't say nothing, right? No, no, no. We can't say nothing. So first of all, he was obviously not willing to give up on Sarai. In other um, times and periods, uh, the tradition might have recommended that he divorce her so that he could remarry someone else to have a child whom he may be more compatible for fertility purposes. He was not willing to do that. Instead, in previous chapters, if you've been reading on your own, as you're meant to do every week, what we see is he appeals to God. He says, God, what good are all these blessings you've given me? What good is this covenant that you have offered me? I have no children. And God promises that there will be children. And in short, Avram prays for children. 
he prays to have a child that will be able to succeed him. Now, therein lies the ultimate problem that has led to Sarai's disappointment, to the problems with Hagar, to the problems of Ishmael, to everything else that comes. Avram made a mistake in how he prayed. I, I know, I know, we live in the modern world where anything that is in our hearts, we pray before God and everybody says, oh, that's so nice and wonderful. All prayers rise before our, our, our Holy One and that everyone should just pour out whatever they are feeling. Poppycock, uh, to use the Aramaic. Judaism has rules about prayers, and those rules are built on stories like this and other episodes throughout the Tanakh of where we get it wrong when we pray wrong. Now, does this mean that if we pray wrong for the wrong thing that God gives it to us anyway like some vindictive genie? No. Prayer is incredibly powerful, not because we are manipulating God, but because when we pray, we are shaping our minds to be able to notice the blessings that God has put in front of us. And depending upon how we pray, we will be more or less attuned to the proper blessings that we should be reaching for. Let me give you a few examples. Let's imagine somebody is um, working very, very hard, and they uh, begin to feel that maybe they are getting run down, that their health is flagging because they've got two jobs, they work overtime constantly. What might they pray for? Well, they might pray for God, please give me the health and the strength to be able to keep providing for my family. Perfectly reasonable prayer, right? And if they do so, their mind will be focused on continuing in that path that they are in and working themselves to death to be able to help their family. And they might do what they can to maintain their health. But ultimately, it is not their flagging health that is the problem in that situation. It feels like it because they have not entertained the, op the idea that perhaps the situation they are in should not be a situation in the first place. That perhaps no one should have to work two jobs in overtime to be able to put food on the table and a roof over the head of a family. That perhaps there are some fundamental inequalities that have led to that situation. And all the health in the world won't address that. And you and your children and your children's children will continue to slave away praying for health while not being able to provide for yourself in that situation. But if we pray for justice, if we pray for opportunity to be able to rise out of that situation, if we pray for a proper distribution of what is being earned, then we'll be aware of opportunities that are beyond just take more vitamins, get a little exercise, have a good night's sleep, and other such solutions, but not solutions at all. Similarly, if somebody is um, struggling to, uh, to pay off their medical bills, they might pray for health. Nothing wrong with praying for health, is there? But would they not be better served by recognizing that there was a deeper problem than their own health, that there was a problem of how they were being forced to pay extortionary rates in order to maintain their health at a minimum level? Time and time again, we pray for things that are not the actual solution. We pray for promotions when what we should be praying for is a better situation in our employment. We pray for a change of life. I want to move away from what we should be praying for is bettering what is here in front of us. Time and time again, we make the wrong prayer. And that means we see the wrong opportunities or we miss the opportunities that God has given to us. And what did we see for Avram? He prays for a child. Did he pray for a child with Sarai? to pray that God, going forward, the only path that will work for me will be one with my wife and I having a child. I don't want a surrogate. I don't want to adopt someone, as he teases in his talk of Eliezer. I want a child with Sarai, the wife of my youth, the wife that has been with me through all of my journeys, the one who has saved my life, by pretending to be my sister, that's where my blessing will not God, and I will accept no other option. Had Avram prayed that way, when Sarai suggested the concubinage of Hagar, he would not have accepted it 
as being a fulfillment of God's promise of a child. Instead, he would have said, no, my wife, that is not the way we're going to get through this. We are not going through it like that. We will find a way through this together, and God will enable us to have that. But Avram was already laughing at the idea even when God promised it. And so, of course, it never occurred to him to reject what Sarai had offered. In his mind, what she was offering was the fulfillment of what he had prayed to God for. Because in his mind, what he had prayed for had shaped that vision, that lens, that only allowed him to see opportunities that didn't include her. That's why she was upset. Not that she knew this necessarily, but because she could feel that she had been put into a situation where she had desperately done something for his benefit that might help her, but mostly for him, and that he had taken it because in the underlying structure of his prayers up till that point, she had not been a central figure. And as Hagar began to uh, develop in pregnancy, it became clear that Sarai was not going to be central in anyone's focus, that she really was going to be cast aside and passed over. That is why she is angry, because the situation had ended up because of the vagueness and the, in, in, uh, the lack of specificity of Avram's prayer, with Sarai being left behind. And that was not the solution that it was supposed to be, which is why God steps in and says, yes, I know you love Ishmael. Yes, he is one of your children, and I will bless him. But it's Sarai, and it's been Sarai all along that the covenant will be maintained through. She is the one that will provide a child that will become the scion of our people. We should pray. People don't pray enough. But when we pray, we must remember the lessons of our people. We don't just pray for what we think we want. We don't just pray for what we hope we'll get. We don't pray for the superficial and for the shallow. We don't pray for what is vain and what is petty. We have to be careful with our prayers. Not because we're manipulating God. God is beyond our power to manipulate. But because we manipulate ourselves. When we pray, our eyes and our hearts must be directed in a way that we will see the actual blessings that God is offering us, rather than the illusionary ones that lead us into so much trouble. We may even give thanks to God, like Avram would for the birth of, of Ishmael, without realizing this was an unnecessary digression, and one that, in the fullness of time, would cause great hardship within his family and throughout history. Pray strong. Pray clear. Pray with the truth of our people. Use the words of the Siddur, for they guide our own words in our heart to help us avoid exactly this problem. And then, keep your eyes open and see what you were able to see, having crafted your heart with those words. Shabbat Shalom.